Hello. Welcome. So who loves movies? Raise your hand. I love movies. I love dramas and comedies and thrillers. But there's one kind of movie I absolutely do not love, and that is virus Armageddon movies. <laughs> you know these movies. It's when a virus basically comes and kills us all dead, right? And the reason I don't love these movies is because one or two things happen. One, we all turn into zombies. Brains, right? Or two, they try to be accurate, but they're so not accurate. They're not. I mean, they try to make a vaccine in 24 hours, or the epidemiologist lives. <laughs> and everyone knows, everyone knows, everyone knows, the epidemiologist would be one of the first to go. That's why I became a microbiologist, just saying. So in the year 2011, another one of these movies came out. It was called Contagion. Anyone see that one? And so I got dragged to this movie, kicking and screaming, and I bought a big old thing of popcorn, and I was going to throw it at the screen every time I saw something inaccurate, right? But this movie was different. This movie reminded me of a lot of the drills we were doing in the lab in case the virus hit the fan. A lot of people died in this movie, and there wasn't a, cure, a quick cure. And the epidemiologist, she didn't make it. But the thing that got me about this movie was the last, oh, say, minute and a half of it. And if you've ever never have seen it, it basically says, shows you how patient zero got the virus. And it's a really simple scene. You basically see a bulldozer come and knock over a banana tree, and a bunch of birds fly away. And then you see a bat come and eat the banana. And then it flies to a pig pen. And then you see a man buying a pig for his restaurant. And then you see the chef preparing the pig, wipes his dirty hands on his apron, and goes and poses for a picture with patient zero. So what did this scene show us other than, wash your hands, people, you need to wash your hands? <laughs> Bird and or bat plus pig plus human is bad juju. It's a recipe for disaster. This is virology 101. If a virus can hop from all those critters, a new virus can infect a human. And new viruses are never good. And in 2009, that very combination came to the United States. The Department of Defense has a global influenza surveillance program. The Army, the Navy, and the Air Force screen flew worldwide because our military deployed worldwide. And in April of 2009, the Air Force flu team was meeting with the Navy flu team in San Diego. And a conversation came up about a non subtypable flu A. So what's that? When you're doing flu surveillance, you're looking for a lot of things, but a couple things. One, is it flu A or B? And two, what do the proteins on the outside of it look like? And they look at hemagglutinin and uraminidase. So that's where you get the H1, H2, N3, N4. So when a virus significantly mutates in the flu virus, it's hard to subtype it. And that's a red flag that it could be new. And new viruses are never good. So after the team's talk, they realized that, hey, this is probably real. So the Air Force team flew back to San Antonio to Brooks, picked up the phone, and thus began the 2009 H1N1 swine flu pandemic that you all are very familiar with. This was a triple reassortment. Bird plus pig plus human got together, had a big old party, and a brand new virus came out. So what happens when you're the first to report a brand new flu? You win a prize called mass pandemonium. <laughs> So the CDC flew from Atlanta to San Antonio to pick up the virus in their own plane. They had their own plane. Who knew they had their own plane? More meetings with more brass than you ever imagined happened. <laughs> Everyone in the metro DC area had our lab director's phone number in their Blackberry. But the testing, oh, the testing. So this was cedar fever season in Texas. Everyone had a sore throat and everyone had a fever. If you had a fever and a sore throat at Lackland, our training facility for the Air Force, you got swabbed and quarantined until your flu test came back. So a laboratory that was getting about 100 flu samples, or sorry, respiratory samples a day, were getting 1,200 respiratory samples a day. So basically 24-7 testing operations had to happen, and more people had to come in to help with the backlog. 
and it was chaos, and it took months to get over. Fortunately for all of us, this was considered a near miss, a close call. Why? Because it was no more deadly than seasonal flu. But it could have been worse. It could have been so much worse. Microbial pathogens are shortening the kill chain. We have bacteria that are becoming more and more resistant to every antibiotic known to man. We have a virus that has mutated to be in a body long enough from someone to take a plane from Liberia all the way to Dallas, Texas without showing any symptoms. And we saw that during the Ebola outbreak. Viruses are mutating just enough where traditional testing can't pick them up. And so people get infected and it spreads before we even know what's going on. So after the pandemic in that fall, I was at a conference with my friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Baldwin. And over dinner that night, over beer, or three, Dr. Baldwin and I had a conversation and it went something like this. Jim, we have to get better about doing biosurveillance. I mean, what if everyone started dropping dead, Jim? What are we gonna do? I mean, what if it wasn't flu? Because at the time, we were only looking for flu. Well, Clarice, we need to start looking for things we don't know instead of things we know. This is a very Jim answer, just saying. Okay, Jim, how would we do that? So it's easy. We'll do next generation sequencing. Okay, and he pulled out a napkin and he proceeded to write down something that would fundamentally change our research program. When you're sick and you go to the doctor, the doctor has to tell the lab what to look for. Look for flu, look for strep, look for an STD. <laughs> so what happens if the test comes back negative? We look for what we know. That's how we do traditional testing. We look for what we know, not what we don't know. Wouldn't it be great to submit a sample and the lab will tell you what's in it? You have to have no need for foreknowledge. So what Jim did on that napkin was design a way that we could chop up all the genetic information in a sample, put barcodes on it, and run it through a data analysis metric that could tell us what was definitively in the sample. No need for guessing, it just tells us. It was really a clever idea. It was a little bit insane, <laughs> let's be honest, um, and expensive, let's be honest again. Do you know how much genetic information is in a patient sample? Do you know? Uh, we were talking about movies earlier. How many of you have seen The Matrix? Do you remember that scene where there's a bunch of ones and zeros coming down, right? Imagine screens like that with A's, T's, C's, and G's, all genetic information. So how do you make that make sense? And how do you do it where it doesn't cost a thousand or more dollars a sample? So Jim said, I have an idea. I have an idea how we can deal with the data and it won't cost as much. And so we went down that path. And not only in this path did we have to learn you know, programming and bioinformatics 101, we had to deal with gigabytes worth of data. We had to change the Air Force dogma on how to handle biological big data. And that in itself was more challenging than the science. So something happened in the tech world as we were doing this, uh, serendipity, we call it. A lot of companies were getting into the next generation sequencing gig and they were challenging each other to make smaller, faster, cheaper sequencers to bring the cost down so everyone could use this technology. And to put this in perspective, in the year 2000, it cost $100 million to sequence a human genome. In the year 2013, any guesses how much it cost? There was no numbers out there. Not that cheap. $3,000. $3,000. We went from $100 million to $3,000 in 13 years. That is an unprecedented pace for technology to come down in price. Way surpassing Moore's law. So how have we, in our lab, used this technology to dismantle the biological kill chain? We're doing it in three steps. All right. Step one, quickly identify what is in the environment before people become sick. Biosurveillance. We have completely improved our biosurveillance platform. We look for everything and everything, not just flu and nasal wash samples. We look for viruses in mosquitoes. We look for viruses in the gut. We look for viruses in everything. 
we take those samples uh, where people are really sick and everything has come up negative and we take a deeper dive in it. We also take samples from our partner labs overseas because a lot of these viruses pop up overseas. So we have become virus hunters. Joking. <laughs> In 2009, this was unheard of. No one was doing this. Very few labs were, because it was expensive. But now, in 2017, there's a few Department of Defense laboratories, especially, that utilize this technology for their biosurveillance program. And by doing so, we have learned so much about the microbial world around us. Step two, <laughs> learn how to get the right information to the right people. This technology produces gobs of information gobs of information. So, but it's really cool, it really is so cool. So, I can tell you what a tick last fed on. Was it a bird? Was it a plane? No, I'm just sorry, it's Superman. So, <laughs> I can also tell you if you brush or floss your teeth based on the bacteria in your blood, mm -hmm. I'm on to you. Do you think my commander cares of whether or not you brush or floss your teeth? Sir? Do you care? Absolutely. <laughs> Wrong answer, sir. Um, <laughs> so, sure he cares, but during an outbreak, probably not so much. Okay, I should have coached him better, just saying. Anyway, <laughs> just joking. This technology offers a lot of information for virologists or for, for um, uh, microbiologists. It can tell you where a virus came from, how it's mutating, where it's mutating, if it's susceptible for therapeutics, or if it's bioengineered, that's a thing now. People are pasting viruses together, like life wasn't scary enough. But we can take that data and put it into usable data that a commander could use, who basically wants to know, what is it? Do my people have it? Do I have to quarantine? How long will I be down? It's the best of both worlds. We can get all this information and then translate it to usable data. Step three, would you like a therapeutic for that? Good man there, yes. <laughs> so you find a brand new virus, now what? Do you wait for the CDC to go to the vaccine process, which is an arduous process that may or may not work? The ZMAP, the experimental Ebola therapeutic, took weeks to grow in tobacco plants and produced milliliters of solution. If you know a virus's genetic code, you can make a therapeutic for that. How? Programmable biomatter. The use of synthetic biology or simple DNA to change and hijack your cell machinery to go after the virus, buying precious time for the vaccine process to work. This isn't science fiction anymore, this is science fact. We are preparing ourselves for the worst. We're trying to get ready for that horrible contagion situation where millions of people are dying. And it's not just for our airmen, it's for everyone. And this is our new frontier. So, <laughs> starting a program from a napkin is not easy. It's downright impossible, and especially in places where very forward thinkers are employed. But some of those best ideas come from outside of the box thinking, right? It was Henry Ford who said, that if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said, a faster horse. And sometimes we are employed at places where we're encouraged to go after the faster horse and not the innovation of an automobile because it's easier. Regular pathogen detection was easy. Anyone could do it. Pretty much everyone could do it. <laughs> Trying to use a new technology to use a genetic code to track it, to trace it, to make it therapeutic for it, that was hard. That was really hard. But it was Elon Musk who said that if it's important enough, you keep doing that even if the odds are stacked against you. <laughs> and there were some serious odds stacked against us. You do it because it's important. We needed an upgrade from the way that we did traditional testing. Bio is the new nuclear. And we needed to be on track on that for that challenge. And to get a handle of the biological kill chain. So a lot of you are from industry tech, and you have different stories about people saying how hard it is to try to do new innovative things. And I'm here to tell you, keep at it. Keep doing it, it's important. 
Even if you get a buck 85 in, in funding, keep doing it. And I'm encouraging leaders to fund your scientists, fund their vision. I promise you, the results can be amazing. And I'm a testament to that. Thank you.